Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Stockholm's Association of International Affairs' first seminar for this uh, autumn semester. We had the honor to co-arrange it together with Stockholm's Institute of uh, International Affairs. My name is Sarah Ibrahim, and I'm the program manager of Utrikes Politiska Föreningen, which is Stockholm's Association of International Affairs. Um, it is a joy to see that you are here today uh, to listen to the seminar on 67 years of humanitarian support to the Palestine refugees um, by the United Nations Work and Relief Agency. Uh, we have the honor to have Pierre Crenbull here today, uh, the Commissioner General of the United Nations Work and Relief Agency himself. Um, he will be presenting the topic today for us. Uh, a special welcome to you, Mr. Kreenbuhl, and thank you for being able to be here today. You're welcome. Um, furthermore, I would like to say a special welcome to Bitta Hammargren. Uh, she will be the moderator, and in a second I will give her the microphone to uh, present more about the topic and present more about uh, Mr. Kreenbuhl. Bitte is, uh, uh, has a long career as a journalist and as a Middle East uh, analytiker, and today she is the editor of Utrikes Politiske Institutet's um, um, Utrikes Magazine. Welcome, Bitte, and thank you for moderating this great seminar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, and um, thanks for hosting us, and a special thanks to Pierre Crenbull, our distinguished speaker today. I know you've had a busy day. You've been to the Parliament, you've been to SIDA, and you're going to have a full day tomorrow as well. You're going to meet with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Margaret Falström. And um, Pierre Cranbill, you have you've been the, the Commissioner General of UNRWA, United Nations Reliefs and the Works Agency, since 2014. And previously, you have also had a long experience in uh, the field of human rights, humanitarian affairs, and development as a director of uh, ICRC's uh, programs. And uh, you have a dire schedule now and a very tough assignment being the head of uh, UNRWA, which was founded, like we said, in 1949, attempted, expected to be a temporary assignment. And now it's been 60 years on. In those days, there were 700,000 registered Palestinian refugees, and today there are more than 5 million. And we have, of course, the situation with, for the Palestinians in Syria, which uh, is well known, and in Gaza and, and Lebanon and in the region as well. For Sweden, there is also, I think, a special legacy with the case of Anawa, uh, because uh, the uh, UN body was founded uh, after the death of Count Folke Bernadotte, and we could see it's sort of the legacy of Count Bernadotte also. And Sweden has have had many prominent personalities in Anawa. One of your predecessors was in Sweden. We've had other prominent Swedes as being directors, and Sweden is also one of the major donors owners to the agency. So, a heartily felt welcome to you. So much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here and an honor. Um, Samar Green, thank you so much for the words of introduction. Also to you, Sarah, thank you for the welcome. It's great to have this opportunity to, to join you here at the university, also acknowledging the presence of uh, the Ambassador of Palestine uh, here with us, um, a great, of course, and close partner to uh, UNRWA's work and relations. It's fantastic to have the joint sort of initiative here with uh, both uh, the Swedish Institute of International Affairs and the Stockholm Association of International Affairs. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you about uh, both the situation in the Middle East, uh, but also, of course, the situation of Palestine refugees specifically, and UNRWA's role and challenges. That's really what I wanted to focus on uh, this evening. But I want to start by saying that it's a, a very big pleasure to be here in Stockholm, also because there is such strong relations between 
UNRWA in Sweden and that the strength of the support that Sweden has provided historically to UNRWA and to Palestine refugees is not limited to the funding support, which is of course very important because at the end of the day we do need the financial support, but it's important because of the very genuine solidarity and passion engagement and trust that exists in the relationship between Sweden and UNRWA. And this is something that has, of course, been reinforced in general terms, in terms of the messaging, and this is an issue we can discuss later, by the very courageous decision of Sweden to recognize Palestine. That's, I think, a very significant statement and act uh, on the ground. But in particular, also the way in which, of course, Sweden supports UNRWA in its work, uh, in diplomatic support, and just simply the very warm feelings that are there expressed in engagements alongside UNRWA in our operational commitments. So I really want to say that that is something that is a, a very uh, stimulating foundation for uh, the relationship, but also a very good reason to be here and to say thank you to the Swedish government, but also to the Swedish people for the trust in our organization. It makes a huge difference for all of my colleagues who are deployed in the field and carry out the work on a daily basis. Now, it has been mentioned, and Ms. Hammergren, you mentioned that you know, UNRWA was uh, created and founded in 1949 as a result of a decision of the UN General Assembly, and you can imagine the UN itself was very young at that time, and was just faced with one of the biggest challenges post-World War II, which was after the creation of the State of Israel, the forced displacement of 700,000 Palestinians from their homes and their arrival in what are still today our five fields of operation, so the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, Gaza, and then Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. That's where we still operate today. And I think, you know, if I look around the room, and what is, by the way, great in the room this evening, is that we have a spread and a very different set of generations present in the room, which is fantastic. But just think for one second of what you would list if you were given 30 seconds to think about big moments in the history of mankind since 1949, what would you list? Well, you may come up with, you know, the beginning and the end of the Korean War, for example, that's 1950-53, right? Now, we don't always have to speak about wars, but uh, let's just take some of those events. You could probably think about the beginning of the Cold War, which uh, for some of us in this room was actually a very concrete experience that we lived through and today find quite challenging to explain exactly what the parameters were about. I just came from Berlin yesterday evening. Well, you see the leftovers of that period very visibly. So the building of the Berlin Wall, let's take that also. But then, extraordinarily, also the destruction of that wall, the unity of Germany and the next phase of the European history. We also had events uh, such as um, the end of apartheid or colonialism in many parts of the world. But we also had uprisings and revolutions throughout Latin America, Africa, processes of self-determination, the independence of so many new countries over those decades. We also had um, events like, uh, well, you can have sporting competitions, depending on your preferences, if you want to list where the different Olympic Games took place over that period since uh, the end of World War II, or football World Cups. The important thing is to remember, by the way, you could add important chapters in the history of Sweden, whatever you would want to share, by the way. I'm always an active learner also, so help me to list some of the events that you think were important in the development of your own country since 1949. But remember that as we think about those events, during that entire period, Palestine refugees have remained refugees. And so, while in Europe we've had both expressions of immense solidarity over the last year or so, but also expressions of big rejection and anger and violence directed against refugees arriving on the continent, I have to tell you as we start this discussion that I have never in my life met a refugee who first wanted to be a refugee, and even much less a refugee who wanted to remain a refugee. And certainly not communities who wanted to remain refugee communities for 
what is now over 67 years. And so the first thing to reflect on when you think about what UNRWA has been doing and working is this historic duration, this sort of sense of permanence of an injustice that was created and done to a people and that has not been corrected. This is an issue I'll come back to. But let us now think about what it means for Palestine refugees to be refugees today in the different areas that we operate in. And I don't want to go into too much detail because it would be interesting also to see what are the issues that you would like to raise later in the discussion. But to be a Palestine refugee today in, say, Palestine itself, to be a refugee in the West Bank or in uh, Gaza, for example. Now let us think about the situation of the generation, in particular young Palestine refugees today in the West Bank. These are people uh, who were born after the Oslo Peace Agreement, which is this moment where there was some degree of optimism and hope. There were lots of disagreements about the parameters and everything, but there was a moment in the early 90s where there was a dynamic towards peace that was at least perceivable and that took some concrete steps. But the generations that we are seeing currently growing up in the West Bank are young people born after Oslo. So think about what they were told since they grew up. They were told by their own leadership, but also by the international community, that if you take moderate positions, if you believe in diplomacy, if you embrace political processes, there will be a reward at the end of the road. There will be a solution. Well, that solution has not materialized on the ground. Far from it, as you know, we have spreading settlements in all directions, in East Jerusalem and in the West Bank, which are on a daily basis making it more complex to imagine how the two-state solution that everybody speaks about and very few people are acting on uh, will actually come about. Freedom of movement is incredibly complex today. You can hardly travel independently or freely from Jenin in the north to Ramallah or from Kalkilia to Hebron. It's a constant challenge. You risk house demolitions, forced displacement of Bedouin communities and others. So all these parameters that you see, and as a young person growing up, you have a bigger chance of facing a checkpoint in your life than uh, an employment opportunity. So these are things that are you know, defining people's lives in a way, and in our refugee camps, uh, say in Bethlehem, which is of course a name that evokes many other things rather than violence and destruction. Well, young children growing up in our camps in Ida and Bethlehem uh, almost face on a daily basis the reality of military incursions by the Israelis and the use of tear gas or arrest even of very young children. So these are the parameters in the West Bank very briefly. In Gaza, you of course know that there have been for people who would be today 12 to 15 year old, but of course also 18, but I'm saying as young as 12 or even a bit younger, they will have experienced three conflicts in their young lives. And when I was there during the war in Gaza in 2014, young children could actually distinguish between incoming and outgoing artillery fire, which I don't think I could do after many years of living in conflict zones. But these young children could distinguish between those two. That's not a future or a, a present that we desire for any child on this planet, but that is the reality. I'll come back to some of the work we do, but we have 250, uh, 260,000 students in UNRWA schools in Gaza alone. 90% of them have never left the Gaza Strip in their life, because only 10,000 permits were given in 2015 to people living in Gaza to be able to leave the Gaza Strip. So you have a one in a hundred years chance to leave the Gaza Strip uh, if you are to wait for your turn in terms of obtaining permits. Young children have seen no freedom of movement out of Gaza, but also those who study in our schools have barely any chance to ever find an employment because Gaza has one of the highest rates of unemployment among youth anywhere on this planet. 65% of youth are unemployed in the Gaza Strip. And you know, the more you think about that, the least you can imagine how that is going to be reconcilable with stability in the region. I cannot imagine 
that if my teenage boys were growing up without freedom of movement, without prospects of employment, with no political horizon or anything else, people would just remain peaceful and be waiting for better terms 20 years down the life because uh, the, your life is just passing on in front of you. So these are the things that I think really have to be thought about and happy to go into this in greater detail later. Syria, to just say a word about what Palestine refugees are facing there. It was, in comparative terms in the region, uh, and I don't like to use this word for refugee communities, but they were in a somewhat more stable situation, waiting for a political solution, of course, but they had the benefit in Syria before the war of having access to employment. So they were self-sufficient communities. Very few of them needed UNRWA in terms of their daily survival needs or simply they, covering the basics of their families. They sent their children to our schools, but they didn't need, they really, you know, the, the, the now sadly famous neighborhood of southern Damascus, Yarmouk, is a place where 160,000 Palestine refugees used to live. They had businesses, they ran shops, they had their own. And when they speak about it today, when you go to Syria and you speak about Yarmouk, which they've had to flee, only a few thousand people still remain in that neighborhood today, they speak about Yarmouk as being, quote, our little Palestine, unquote. So you can feel the emotional attachment to the place, how important it was, how much dignity came with it. And now it's another generation of Palestinians that have been faced with the trauma and the consequences of loss of home, loss of livelihoods, loss of place of, say, the anchor of dignity, and also, of course, loss of friends, neighbors, and relatives. And that sits very deep in the community right now, massively displaced inside Syria, and which our colleagues are trying the best way possible to support. Now, that being the focus on Palestine refugees, I also wanted to tell you a word about the work uh, that we do. And I won't go into details, happy to, you know, to take any of your questions out, but I just wanted to share with you two things that were my biggest discoveries when joining UNRWA because I come from a more classic emergency humanitarian background in the International Committee of the Red Cross. And here, my biggest discovery was education. UNRWA runs 700 schools in the Middle East with 22,000 education staff that we employ. Uh, you know, 99% are Palestine refugees themselves. And the extraordinary dimension about education is that, you know, when you think about conflict zones and you think about people who are victims of violence or injustice, very often humanitarian aid looks at them as victims and then we do the distributions of food, medicine, water and others. But you do approach the person from the perspective of being a victim. Which, by the way, <coughs> Palestine refugees are victims of a historic injustice. But nobody in their lives want to be seen only as victims. And the strength of education, which by the way exists as a vision in the Palestinian community itself, the attachment to education, the strength of education is when you look at the person, you look at a person also as an actor of his or her own destiny. And that's a completely different paradigm when you relate to the person. And the strength and energy and passion that I see among school children, boys and girls in UNRWA schools throughout the Middle East is something extraordinary. And they're attached to that because their parents, their grandparents already, and they themselves know education is the only basis on which you can preserve future opportunities. And in every single conference of this type that I give, there's always somebody in the room who at the end comes down and says, you know, I'm a Palestine refugee, I, my father uh, grew up in Ein el Helwe, my mother was a teacher in Beit Hanun. And there is this collective presence of Palestine refugees around the world, but there is also the anchor of their opportunity for the future. This, in addition to what we do in healthcare, you know, microfinance and many other things, is what I found the most extraordinary discovery. And we are keeping alive, therefore, the prospects for Palestine refugees to actually continue to achieve things in their lives. Of course, against all odds, in a region that is so unfavorable, if you want it, in terms of the conditions for employment and access to employment. We can come back to that uh, theme as well. A last couple of thoughts, just uh, before we open on this. Two things. The first is that UNRWA, 66 years in operation, is also a more painful reminder. There is a more painful side to UNRWA after 66 years. And you said it, uh, 
some grain. It's um, one aspect is of course that it was never foreseen to be in existence for so long. And today still UNRWA is a living reminder of the failure of the international community to resolve this conflict politically. And I have to tell you, uh, related to my point earlier that I have never met a refugee who wanted to be or remain a refugee, there is nothing more important today than to recreate the political horizon. It is a huge risk in the Middle East to leave the issue of the conflict between Israel and Palestine unattended. Right now the world is looking at Syria, at Iraq, at Yemen and Libya, for very good reasons, by the way. I'm not trying to create here a competition or an artificial hierarchy of needs and concerns. But to think that we can kind of leave this issue aside and hope, as I hear it often from international mediators, for better days in terms of the relationships between Israel and Palestine. To leave it to a time where the time would just become right or ripe for negotiations is another illusion. Negotiations are not, there's never time that is ripe for negotiations. You start them because it's going to take a long time anyway, because of the trust that has to be created. I mean, look at what just happened in Colombia. It took years to reach the Colombian deal that was just achieved. It took years to achieve the agreement on the Iranian nuclear program. To delay the start is a disinvestment in human dignity and in security in the region. But what Europe saw last year is, you know, ignore the region at your own risk. Because if Europe continues to think that we can look at these crises from a distance and think they won't spill over at one point, well, I think we saw last year what happens. Neglect Israel and Palestine is neglecting one's own concerns, the regional security, the dignity of people, but also the regional security of Europe. Now, I want to end with one thing that isn't very much in store in the Middle East these days, at least in apparent terms. Uh, but that is so important for everyone and so important in particular for young people uh, among the Palestine refugee community. And that is hope. And I just wanted to share an anecdote with you, which is that during the Gaza conflict in 2014, I visited on many occasions the Gaza Strip and in one of the visits I found, together with one of my colleagues, this notebook in the middle of a destroyed UNRWA school. So an entire section of one of our school buildings was uh, bulldozed by an Israeli tank and we found in the middle of the rubble this notebook in a neighborhood that was very badly affected by the conflict. Now, as one of my colleagues opened it and looked at the name, he saw that it belonged to a young girl who at the time was 13 years old, Rua Hadeh. And he looked at what was inside, and because he, of course, speaks and reads Arabic, which I don't, he shared with me what was in it. And in it, she had entered a number of poems. And one of the poems that uh, was in the book that she wrote about is this one. And this poem is about hope. And in it, she wrote that um, the hope is a friend that never betrays you. It may go away for a while, but it always comes back. And she also says that happiness is something one shouldn't look for in the neighbor's garden, but one should nurture in one's own garden. Now, we did not know at that moment whether Rua had survived the war, where she was, by the way, because the neighborhood around Lua was very, very badly destroyed. But I did say on that very day that if she did survive, if she had survived the war, uh, we wanted her to come and recite this poem at the inauguration of the school, because, of course, UNRWA never gives up. So we would rebuild the school and reopen it, which we did. And in April 2015, during the inauguration, she was there because she had survived the war, and she recited the poem. Then she handed her notebook back to me. She wanted me to keep it. And I promised her, since she, as many children in the Gaza Strip, have never been able to leave the Gaza Strip in their lives, that her message and her story would travel with me and be shared around the world. So I'm very happy to share it with you. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much for such a powerful speech, comprising both the historical context and, and the glimpses of, of what life is, could be like for a refugee, including this child in Gaza. Before I leave the floor to questions, uh, let me just highlight a few things. Uh, if you want to tweet, which you are most welcome to do, you can use either the hashtag UI event or UF Stockholm, right? And we apologize for the pictures here on, on the wall. They're not so clear due to the light in the room, but it's from Anna's website anyway. Now, I may allow me to, to ask you two questions um, before we leave the floor to, to further questions. Uh, you spoke about um, the need of education. I myself have traveled in the, the Middle East and come across Palestinian refugees since 1979. In those days, I felt among Palestinians in Lebanon and, so, and other places that there was a feeling that education can make a difference because you can really change the life of yourself and your family if you go into education. And in today's situation, the Palestinians are so much more limited. So what can the world community do to give Roha and, and other children in, in Gaza the feeling that education really can make a difference. How can we install them with the feeling that moderation will help them at the end of the, the day? That's, um, yeah, I think that's a very important point. The first thing is, I sense in visiting and meeting with families, and it's, it's also documented in interesting reports that have been produced among which uh, a recent World Bank report that studied UNRWA's education system in Jordan, uh, West Bank, and in Gaza, that um, the feelings are still very, very strong and powerful inside the community about the importance of education. Let me give you an example of this, which um, is not very well known, because in the Syrian context, you have... Um, ongoing efforts by UNRWA to provide education services. When we think about war zones, one often thinks that education is something you set aside, you concentrate on the emergency needs, food, water, medicine, etc., and education you take it back later. Well, we're continuing to provide education in school buildings, and for those who can't, we use actually a television station, happy to invite you to go and see the programs on YouTube, broadcasting from Gaza and broadcasting education programs to children in Syria, which, by the way, Syrian children also use, to continue to receive their education. And I think it's by keeping these types of initiatives alive that we tell them that we never give up, and that that education that they feel so strongly about, and that the parents invest in, and the teachers invest in, is very important. 120 students, now you have to imagine, just think of some of the worst images of destruction in war zones that come to your mind. Just think of Aleppo right now. Right? So there's the, the neighborhood of Yarmouk in the south of Damascus is exactly that. And that was an area for Palestine refugees historically. And this year, in August, I saw that our efforts to bring 120 students out of Yarmouk. And what did they come out of Yarmouk for? They came out to sit their national exams, if you can believe that. So Yarmouk is a place without electricity, there's no water, barely any supplies. 120 students came out and sat their national exams. And the average across Syria of Palestine refugees who took the national exams and graduated this year was higher than for Syrian students. This is something which tells you how attached people are. So how can we nurture this and keep it alive? First of all, by ensuring that the schools stay open. As a year ago, we almost had to postpone the school year because of lack of funding, unbelievably, but that's the case. And the other thing is the international community has to, to and we can contribute to this, but UNRWA cannot achieve this alone, create a much better connection between those children who come out of the school 
and who look for employment opportunities because there just are not enough employment opportunities. Now, this is also true for Syrians, of course, and this is a challenge, but in general throughout the region, we have to be able to create better opportunities because it's true if students just simply go through ten, nine or ten years of school and then don't come uh, see a prospect later on, there could be that increasing level of despair. And in that case, they will not believe that moderate paths are what should be pursued. And you know, think about it again. I mean, I say, why is it so important that the world not forget Palestine refugees? Well, it's so important for the reason that you raised at the very beginning, which is that it's 5.2 million people. That's the population of your neighbors in Norway. That's the population of Singapore or of Ireland. And we cannot have a population as large as that in the Middle East without a solution, politically, without a future, being denied their rights. And let me tell you what one of our students said to Mr. Ban Ki-moon when he visited the last time uh, in June. He came to the Gaza Strip and we had him meet some of our members of school parliaments, school councils representing the interest of the students. And he spoke about the importance about human rights. Yeah? Sort of take moderate views, think about tolerance, human rights, important. One of our students said, Mr. Secretary General, we study about human rights here in the UNRWA school, we love human rights, but I have one question to you. Why do they not apply to us? And that's a pretty powerful question. I can tell you the Secretary General didn't, was very moved, <laughs> and his entire entourage understood suddenly that here's a dimension that you know, needs to be integrated into the international narrative if we are serious about our messages to this young and growing generation. I mean, I completely agree. I, I've never found um, children anywhere or young people anywhere who are so knowledgeable about, about international humanitarian law as the Palestinians. Mm. Uh, they know the articles there. But if I mean, Gaza, as you mentioned, is, is one tinder box and um, Yarmouk is um, such a tragic case with the siege and what people suffer there. But may I just take some um, uh, impressions from Lebanon that I last visited in September, where many of the Palestinians from Syria have fled to. And in today's Lebanon, every fourth inhabitant is a refugee from Syria. Added to that, the Palestinians. And they feel that they are the lowest ones on the ladder because they cannot apply for asylum via the UNHCR being Palestinians, and they cannot buy property because they are not able to do so by Lebanese law. Uh, they cannot uh, open a bank account, and they cannot have access to a higher education in the Lebanese school system. And what they said to me is that we know that we will never have the right of return to Palestine. We know that. I mean, we've been here for in Lebanon refugees are we are the the the, the uh, descendants of the those who fled in forty eight, and we know that uh, there is no future for us in Lebanon. So I would say that this is another tinderbox here. Again, uh, th th there were explosions among the Palestinians in Lebanon years ago. It may happen again. What can be? What message can be given to Palestinians in Lebanon? Yeah, that is a really uh, difficult one because Lebanon is a, a very unique situation. Um, on the one hand, uh, the Palestine refugee community face exactly what you have been describing, and and the, the most critical element being the lack of access to employment. And this is not by default in the Lebanese context; it's by decree that. Uh, Palestinians do not have access to employment in over 40 different professions. Of course, that, to say the least, limits to the extreme the opportunities. And that means, and I re recently visited one of the camps in uh, um, Beirut, which of course in the history has one of the most painful uh, accumulation of tragedies, which is Shatila camp, uh, with all the events in 82, but also beyond, and... Um, and when you see young people there, uh, you realize they are in our schools, but there is absolutely no prospect for a vast majority of them to ever work in, in their lives. So, of course, again, either you, when in addition to this, you have to welcome and you are a refugee, but you become the host 
of Palestine refugees fleeing Syria, because we have integrated them and they have been welcomed by many of the families, you really think that you know the future that you have is incredibly limited. And I think there are very few messages that can be given right now to Palestine refugees that are going to be huge encouragements, also because Lebanon itself, and this is, let us be very honest here, and you mentioned the figure, you know, has welcomed over a million and a half refugees altogether. Now, I can make that comparison with Switzerland, because Switzerland, my home country, has exactly the double of Lebanon's population, which means that in comparative terms, Switzerland would have welcomed three million Austrian refugees, for example. Now, now we have in Switzerland uh, quasi-hysterical debates when we have to welcome 3,500 refugees. Hmm. So, when we realize what Lebanon carries, you know, we have to realize that solidarity with the neighboring countries has to grow and increase very seriously. But again, what can we promise Palestine refugees? Well, two things, frankly. And this is really where the international community has to make up its mind. Either the international community says, this has gone on long enough and we need political solutions, which is really the n number one priority. But if the world is not prepared to take courageous actions in that regard, which currently is clearly not, sadly, well then at least to ensure that the needs of the community are covered in ways that are dignified. And that is currently not yet the case either. So to have you know, hesitation on both fronts is going to be very, very detrimental to human dignity and regional security. Thank you. So it's time for questions, and I think we can take them two by two. We have one gentleman there and another. And please state your name and affiliation, or whether you're a student here or have another affiliation. Uh, thank you for a very good uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Hormus Kapadia. I'm not representing any organization, but I just want to ask you, what was Tony Blair's involvement in the Palestinian um, I mean, he had some mission some time ago, which he has left now. Could you enlighten us on, us on this? Because it might have something to do with your organization. Thank you. He was the head of the International Quarter for the Middle East Peace Process. Please. My name is Avaya Sheikh. <coughs> Originally, I belong to Pakistan, now living here since 2013. And uh, really, your thought-provoking uh, speech impressed us all and appreciate Tundra's uh, continuous uh, support on humanitarian grounds, Palestine, uh, Palestinian refugees. Uh, as you himself uh, accepted, and this is a historical fact, that even after the lapse of 67 long years, the co political conflict between Israel and Palestine is there. It is not resolved. Uh, this unfortunate, of course. Uh, well, uh, have you ever uh, uh, worked or thought uh, your organization to promote people-to-people -people contact between Israel and Palestine? And I am sure there are a lot of uh, Palestine people who increasingly want to live in peace with the Palestine people and the similar is the position in Palestine. Uh, I have had the experience of 21 years of peacekeeping between two nuclear armed conflict ridden countries of South Asia, Pakistan and India who fought four wars. And when they, be, um, they, when they became uh, nuclear powers, uh, you see it was very dangerous uh, situation. So what we did, we started people-to-people -people contact organization. We established on people's level in India, in Pakistan. And in 1995, very, very, it was difficult to go to uh, t take 100 people to India on people-to-people -people level contact, but we did. And your question. Yeah. And I my, think you have my to question, wrap up. Yeah. And we succeeded in, in, uh, in uh, building a people's pressure on respective governments to help governments to sit across the table and start negotiations. So similarly, uh, similar, uh, similar uh, efforts uh, can you do with Palestine and, and uh, Israel to settle this uh, conflict? Thank you. 
I'm not sure I can enlighten you greatly on, on Tony Blair's role, but he was appointed as the head of the quartet, as you said, in, which is, of course, um, a structure that is, in particular, was historically set up it, in composed of the United States, um, as well as uh, the Russian Federation, uh, the United Nations, which one am I missing? And the EU. EU. The EU, to um, uh, actually well, originally promote peace and interactions, but he focused then in particular on the economic side of development in the, in the region. So, of course, um, yes, there were contacts between us and uh, the Quartet's office, but not that he would have had now a particularly significant role on UNRWA's work, for example. So it was more a focus on the political and the economic sort of development side. Now, um, currently, I think, the framework, and that maybe just allows us to bring to it back to the political initiatives. One thing that I'm very much struck by, whether it's um, in the quartet, but also just generally internationally, is that people express continuously a huge amount of skepticism about the possibility to resolve the conflict between Israel and Palestine. And I think that skeptical attitudes are one of the worst forms of surrender in the international system because actually there has been such an overemphasis over the last two decades on military interventions on the one hand, which have brought stability to none of the countries where they've taken place, and on the other hand to humanitarian aid, which I should advocate for, but um, which simply we know never bring solutions or never address the root causes of issues. So we need a revival in the international community of political conflict resolution. And we've seen much too little of that. It's one of the weakest parts of the international system currently, in addition to probably the lack of courage that we currently observe on the issue of um, Israel and Palestine in terms of the international community's position. Now, the people-to-people -people contacts are, of course, absolutely uh, essential in any situation of conflict or polarization. It's very often, it's absolutely crucial to keep links between people. The problem is that on the ground today, everything is separating people, not bringing them together. You know, take the example of a young person growing up in Gaza, a Palestinian student, whereas their parents and grandparents would have still, under a variety of circumstances, been in contact, sometimes lived in same neighborhoods, worked together with Israelis. Today, young people growing up in Gaza have never seen an Israeli in their life. You know, the place is blockaded, you cannot cross the place, you cannot leave the Gaza Strip. The only thing that you know from the Israeli perspective is the tanks, the drones, the destruction, the fear. And frankly speaking, on the Israeli side, it is fewer and fewer young people have ever met a Palestinian in their life. So how the world thinks that this is going to improve uh, the chances. And you know one of the things, and you know it from your own uh, context uh, between India and Pakistan, the cost for people to advocate for moderate positions in a time of polarization is very high. Because when things become polarized, it takes a lot of courage to stand in front of people and say, I refuse the polarization. The greatest temptation is to join the polarization because it requires far less courage. It requires huge courage to stand in front and say, I refuse the polarizing dynamics and I tell you, we need to embrace a path of moderation. And very few people right now are prepared to take that risk. But I hear people in the international community blaming local actors for not showing enough courage. And I always answer that before you blame somebody else uh, for lack of courage, are you showing enough courage in the international community to bring the parties to a table? And right now that is lacking very dramatically. Good point. We have a question in the back seat, the back row in the middle. The very back. Is that? Can, yes. Can you? Thank okay. You. Yes. Please. And then, and then, th oh, the gentleman behind you. Should, no, go ahead. Please. Okay. 
Uh, my name is Philippe. Um, I'm not a student here in Stockholm. I was a student in Lund before. Um, I, I thought it was extremely interesting to, to hear you both uh, speak, especially about the, the importance uh, of, of the schooling system for, for the Palestinian refugee community. Uh, I have a question and a comment. I will try to articulate it as best as possible. But... Um, it might not be accurate, but it is my, my perception, both from uh, having worked in, in uh, Balata, the West Bank's largest camp, uh, with refugee children and young people, and also from, from research on this topic, that um, Onaro schools have um, somehow focused a lot on education, but from a very practical perspective, so as a, as a way to... Uh, increase someone's life chances to to allow someone to get a better job and to to have a better life in general um, but for some reason students and, and and especially teenagers they feel that that it has become increasingly or or from the beginning very politically neutral so they feel that they don't have a lot of space or as much as space as they would like to to, to discuss the actual conflict um, so and since you've spoken about uh, the the, how crucial it is to recreate this this horizon, uh, this political horizon, and 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 to get to to, to give them back their hope. Um, I was wondering how it is possible to reconcile the role of of schools as as a place to to I mean to to increase your life chances, but also as a place or as a locus for developing citizenship, active citizenship. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you, and then pass on the microphone to one of the back rows. Thank you. Um, so I'm actually on the board of SIA here in Stockholm. Um, I'm responsible for the mentorship program here. Um, and my question is um, based on the level of unemployment in for Palestinian youth at 65%. Um, and the figures of microfinance um, that's up on the board. You didn't mention that in your speech, but are the microfinancing projects that um, you run having any um, like significant or uh, like noticeable effects on mitigating these like incredibly high numbers for youth unemployment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Interesting. Two two really interesting points. Um, the first one is is a really important discussion on um, the schools, but it's also I'll I'll, you, I'll draw a parallel to what happens also with um, the debates that we have internally in terms of our staff. Now. You're absolutely right that it is a dilemma that's significant if you go and study, because you know, anybody who has studied in his or her life wants to knows that one of the things, of course, we've all gone through things that we had to learn by heart and we absolutely loved, of course, all of us. Um, and then there are the things which stimulated us more, which was sort of taught us, you know, critical and creative thinking, hopefully. Um, and that mix isn't uh, always easy to reconcile. But UNRWA's reforms over recent years in the education system has led to far more critical thinking than simply rote memorization. So I think there's been a real transformation there in the way in which things are being taught in the classroom. But it's always a challenge effectively, and you, you pointed to a very important issue, which is how do you also create a space for children to debate the reality of their situation as opposed to only discussing, for example, in the context of our human rights program, because we have a human rights program, for example, you know, the lessons of Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela, which is all very important, but then the question can be, so how does this relate to me, where I am today, to the realities that I face, occupation, unemployment, whatever, blockade, etc. And it's not an easy issue to reconcile because of one particular reason that is specific to UNRWA, which is that we are a UN agency. So, of course, we are not, our role is not to promote you know, a singular or specific narrative. Of course, we are related intimately to the Palestinian cause through the experience that we are a single focus organization and that Palestinians have the experience that they have from 1948 onwards. But of course, we also have to be able in what we teach and the way in which we teach to have a curriculum that is reconcilable with messages that are, of course, representative not only of the Palestinian perspective, but also, of course, of the UN's 
let's say, set of values and what we, the UN demonstrates, which is human rights and others. So there's always going to be that challenge. But I liked very much the way that you presented it on the citizenship element. And here, let me give you a couple of examples that for me have been really interesting in that regard. The first is we had a well-known Western ambassador visit one of our schools, Western ambassador uh, in, in, in the wider, in the broader sense, at large, uh, visited one of our schools and sat down with a group of our school parliamentarians. And the discussion was, you know, the, the discussion started, the presentation started from some of our students. We are members of the school parliament, this is what we do. Um, and by the way, uh, since you're also representing a donor country, couldn't you help to expand our school? So that was fairly safe and... Uh, but then after one point, about, after about 10 minutes, one of the girls in the classroom said, and by the way, I now want to tell you what it is to grow up as a young girl under occupation. And I want to tell you what it means every morning when we come to the school to have to go through the checkpoint. She pointed to the settlement that is just across the road. She said, she showed the, the windows and said the impacts of the tear gas canisters that fly through the windows. She described the fear for her and her classmates about the situation of their brothers who are often out in the streets and then demonstrating because of the violence that is taking place. And these things are of course being described in the sense of not saying we want to constrain or limit because that is at a certain moment the expression of her citizenship, if not yet a full Palestinian citizenship, at least a, a global citizenship. I am a person, you cannot deny me my identity, and here I am, and this is what I've learned, and I'm going to tell you about what I feel. And this part, I think, to the point where it is something that can be communicated in ways that are in that spirit of describing, as opposed to then necessarily advocating the means, in particular, of course, if it were violent means, that then becomes a challenge for UNRWA very openly. Um, I think that is an absolutely essential part of growing up in that environment and to be able to self-analyze one's situation. Because in many places I'm asked whether we are teaching young Palestinian boys or girls to be tolerant. In other words, the subtext is, are you teaching them to be respectful of the neighbors? And I say, well, I hope that that is one thing that we're teaching. But what I know is when you teach human rights, the first thing you teach people, and this was the example I gave earlier with Mr. Ban Ki-moon, is you teach a self-awareness about whether your rights are being respected or denied. That's the first stage. And that is a very, very important stage. And so, yes, I'm absolutely determined that we continue to teach human rights, not to lecture, but for the self-awareness. Yes, it's important, because with self-awareness starts the journey down the line of saying, I am a global citizen and you cannot deny me that. And then, of course, we hope that somebody in the world takes care of the rest of the citizenship to be looked at. So yes, I think it's a, it's a fine line, which we feel also in the staff that works with UNRWA, because of course, I just want to make the parallel, our staff, our Palestinian staff, of course, very often, like during the, the Gaza conflict in 2014, many of our staff members said, you know, if I cannot write something on my Facebook page that I feel outraged about what is happening, well, then how do I reconcile that with being Palestinian? And I said, I do not expect a single Palestinian to be neutral in emotional terms about what is happening. But you are a UN staff member, and that implies certain responsibilities. Just as they do for me. Just, of course, it's a different case because I'm not exposed historically as a Swiss citizen to the type of injustice that the Palestinians have lived. But it is that fine line between the two. But I hope we can continue to build on these types of explorations. And one of the great things is also to bring together students from our different areas for them to increase the self-awareness in that regard. So I, I think it's a very interesting point that you, you raised. On the microfinance side, since 1991, when the microfinance program started, we have um, invested and, and provided credit and loans to uh, Palestinians uh, throughout our areas of operations uh, in an amount that reaches over $400 million. So it is significant in terms of volume. It means in many cases that people have been able to start local initiatives, local enterprises, startups and things like this. And we have seen that not only have they repaid, but then they have retaken loans to expand the business, etc. So it is encouraging. But, you know, we have to remember 
that in order to be more broadly sustainable, the conditions of the market, of course, are very important. So take, uh, again, just the example of Lebanon before. If you can't sustain the employment because all of the conditions are discriminatory around you, uh, UNRWA can increase the, 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 the credit, but it won't be sustaining, of course, the initiatives. Uh, because you can't produce at a scale that is large enough to make it meaningful. The same for Gaza. I mean, let me just give you one example of a very direct consequence for the community in Gaza. Already you have very low levels of employment in Gaza. Recently, a new restriction was imposed in terms of import on Gaza, which was about wood, because it was considered to be potentially what is called dual use. Hmm. Yeah? Wood can be used in construction of a school, but it was also said to be able to be used in the construction of a tunnel. So this limit, and they limited to wood planks that would be no thicker than a centimeter. Which that's not very solid when you build things. But now, the reality is that one of the areas and one of the sectors of Gaza's economy that was still fairly dynamic was carpentry, production, furniture, the buildings, is essentially being wiped out right now because you can't import the materials anymore, and you can't export. So, all of these dynamics, while we can put in credit and microcredit at a more structural level, it won't sustain if the market doesn't create you know, the initiatives that are sufficient. And this is where the interlinkages between what we do and the change in the fundamental situation, lifting of the blockade and others, is absolutely necessary. Thank you. It's a time is really running fast while listening to you. It means we only have four more minutes, right? We have to keep the time limit. We have several people who want to ask questions. I, we would only have a chance to have two questions, extremely short ones. And I know, I think you one of the first here, and we have somebody here. Yes, please. Shireen, our colleague. Hi, um, thank you so much for your talk. It was excellent and very moving. My question is very short, and it's not really about UNRWA, but um, oh, my name is Shireen, and I work, I re I'm a researcher on Palestine at the Swedish Institute for International Affairs. Uh, but my question is on really uh, your um, question of recreating the political horizon. And I work with a lot of Palestinian refugees in the diaspora who basically feel that the Oslo Accords sidelined the Palestinian right of return and that they will not be able to return unless the international community is willing to kind of think about a one democratic state solution instead of a two state solution because they think the two state solution is territorially kind of difficult at this point. So I was just wondering on your opinion on that really and uh, I mean I know Anura's stance on it but your personal opinion. That's a hard one for a two-minute answer. Please, Hans Corell. Thank you, Hans Corell, former legal counsel of the United Nations. And uh, I listened with great interest to your presentation. And of course, I visited Gaza officially during my tenure in the UN, 94 to 2004, when Peter Hansen was the High Commissioner. I have um, first information. I am now co chair in the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute. We have taken an initiative to bring together young lawyers from Israel and Palestine. And we actually had a meeting in Washington in September where there were 15 of them on the panel, together with people from the office of the quartet. It was rather a moving experience to see how they interacted. And this is the new generation. And this is, comes to my question about leadership. And I have been involved after I left the UN, both with the Palestinians and the Israelis. I've been at Al-Quds University with Sarah Indusibi, was uh, the president, and then also I had a discussion with Aaron Barak at the Mishkanot Anim about the judgment of the Supreme Court on the settlements. My concern is that you need leadership on both sides, and both sides must be convinced that they can deliver. And when I looked then at the agreement between Hamas and Fatah in Cairo a few years ago, I just shook my head. Can people understand what this is? Can you really on the Palestinian side demonstrate that you can have a united 
shall we say, delegation that can negotiate an agreement which you can deliver. And the same thing on the Israeli side. What is your assessment here? Is there a willingness, really, on the Israeli side to come to a conclusion and that they can sit down and negotiate an agreement and that both sides can deliver? Finally, when I look at the UN and find a loose end in the whole UN system and start pulling and pulling and pulling, I always end up in the Middle East. And the reason is that the Security Council is not using the same yardstick in the Middle East as they use elsewhere. Thank you. Big issues. Is it possible to have short answers due to the time limit? So, um, Oslo, the, the right of return, and the two-state uh, solution versus the you know other options for the future. Now, I think the first thing uh, on this is, you know, we we all know that the right of return is perceived certainly and live on the Israeli side as something immensely challenging because of the demographic issue. The thing about it is, however, that we also have to remember that the international community invokes and encourages the right of return in almost every other refugee situation in the world. So I worked in Bosnia, and every single representative of the international community insisted heavily that Bosnian Muslims should be allowed, and quite rightly so, to return to the areas in Bosnian Serb er territories that they had been expelled from. So. I think one just has to remember this is the yardstick element. Now, I'm not suggesting that every situation is the same, but international law applies or should apply the same way. Now, that doesn't change the emotional factor. And that is why, during many rounds of negotiations, the Clinton parameters were put down that gave a choice. The idea was to give a choice to Palestine refugees. If you just impose a solution at the end on Palestine refugees, you will not get stability. If you offer a range of options, yes, you will. And one of them is based on the premise that it is therefore highly unlikely that everybody will invoke the original right of return. But if there were a Palestinian state independent that you could go to, you might have a prospect for better stability. And here I must say that as much as we all feel that the prospects for a two-state solution are being currently undermined by a number of developments in the Middle East, including the expansion of settlements. If the international community starts to say, while, to be very frank, wearing the badge that you are in favor of the two-state solution, right? We all wear a badge saying, we love the two-state solution, but we're not doing anything about it. It's like if you wear a badge on the universal peace, you just say you're in favor of universal peace. Are you doing anything about it? So, however, if we start to now discuss openly about other options, what we're doing is we're further undermining the prospects of the two-state solution, which currently, I think, is still the most serious prospect on the table. To start to explore on the side other things weakens the prospect further, because it seems to suggest that it's okay to continue with what is undermining on the ground the two-state solution. So I think one has to, just in conceptual and political terms, be very careful. Currently, the two-state solution, while it is true, it is at risk, at threat, but it is still the most serious proposal on the table. To pull that away and start to dismantle it means you're actually we weakening further the possibility that it be achieved through negotiations. So I think we have to keep that focus element in mind. The leadership element is very important. It's uh, no doubt, and I think, uh, you know, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of Palestinians themselves because that's not my role, but I think to observe that in any community, when you face a determined, whether it's an adversary, a negotiating partner on the other side of the table, and you yourself are divided, it's of course you're in a weaker position than if you're united. And I think. Any approach today should be focused, but also encouraged by the international community to recreate unity uh, among uh, Palestinians. And right now, I'm not sure that that is happening and being very supported also internationally. So this is certainly a big challenge. But that is not to excuse the fact that I think everybody should also look internally at their own issues. And I'm sure that within the Palestinian leadership, that is a debate that takes place, but it is also very necessary to think about how does one create and recreate that uh, solid element. Whether there is a willingness on the 
Israeli side. Currently, there are certainly no strong signs that there is a willingness to implement or to take it forward in concrete terms. But again, you know, I have to be mindful that UNRWA's mandate is not a political mandate, so we may not be in every discussion and aware, of course, of every development. So here I have to... But what I would say is, is, is this. Think of what happened in the Colombian case. So here you have the former Minister of Defense who becomes president. So, you know, people looking at it from a distance, people who wouldn't know President Santos or who would, might think that the very minister who f led the war against the FARC for a prolonged period of time may not be the person who gave the greatest signals originally of being in favor of peace. And yet, he is the man who then decided at one point to take the step forward. So, it can also be in the most unlikely circumstances. So if we are simply, because this is what is happening currently, if the attitude of the international community is to stand by the side of the road or the side of the track, look at the train, the Middle East train passing in one way or the other, commenting on the order of the carriages, on the color of the train, the speed of the train, we have to get on board of that train. Because right now, nobody is really climbing on board and getting you know, the, the mud on the boots, the, the hands into the engine and everything, and participating in this. We're all commenting, and this is not the sense of your question, as I know, but this is a little bit what I hear very often in the international. We're all commenting on the willingness or lack of willingness locally. We're commenting on the courage or lack of courage of the political leaderships, but the international community is nowhere to be seen. And so, you know, I hear it in dinner t in Jerusalem, where international representatives say, I regret the lack of courage, some will say of President Abbas, others will say, I, I regret the willingness. I say, if you want to regret the lack of courage of anybody, well, you have to be prepared to be analyzed in terms of the courage that you show. And right now, I see a lack of courage, a lack of inspiration, a lack of leadership by the international community, and I really hope that we can start to understand that to not show more courage is coming at an exponentially rising price and cost for people in the region, all people in the region, but also internationally, and we saw it in Europe recently. 5.2 million Palestine refugees have historically chosen to remain in the region as much as possible. They can also decide to move one day. It's a big number. Well, that's an excellent finalizing point, I would say, and courage begins at home with ourselves. Thank you so much for this thought-provoking speech, and uh, I think everybody goes from here with new ideas and, and in our minds. Thank you. And very nice to be here. Thank you.